five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We're sure you've heard this one before. It's kind of un-American if you haven't. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong climbed down a ladder, pressed his boot into the fine, powdery surface of the moon, and declared... More than 50 years later, the Apollo 11 moon landing is still considered a monumental moment in human history, full of leadership and lessons that transcended time and circumstance. It's an enduring symbol of American achievement, an instance where a nation came together and accomplished the impossible. And we did it first. But our journey to the moon started long before that historic summer day, just over a decade earlier, as a matter of fact. And a one-ton piece of that history resides inside HMNS. I'm Emma Schkloven. And I'm Johnny Hemberger. And this is Beyond Bones, a podcast from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Here at HMNS, we take care of a collection of more than 2.5 million artifacts. Each of these objects, from the most hulking T-Rex skeleton to the tiniest seashell, has a story. We're taking you behind the scenes to find out where they came from, how they ended up in our care, and what we do to preserve them because there's so much Beyond Bones happening inside our halls. Tucked behind glass in the back corner of our astronomy hall, Mercury capsule number six isn't much of a looker. Dingy, scratched, and dented, with its wiry guts hanging out for all to see. This chromium-colored mass of metal from the dawn of American spaceflight looks a bit like one of those high school chemistry beakers, the bell-shaped kind with a wide bottom that slowly transitions into a bottleneck. It sure doesn't match the visions of sleek ships packed with blaster cannons and laser beams many imagine when they hear about space travel. Quite frankly, it seems almost slapdash, like someone grabbed random aluminum sheets, various washers, and any bolt they could find from their dad's garage and soldered the structure together with a wing, a prayer, and maybe... Hopefully, some math formulas. Plus, as HMNS Curator of Astronomy Dr. Carolyn Sumners puts it, this prized piece of nascent NASA history is, well... It's just small. The Mercury capsule is impressively small. Like, really small. Alan Shepard, the tallest astronaut in Project Mercury, clocked in at 5 foot 11 and 170 pounds leaving him very little wiggle room inside the nine-foot-tall, six-foot-wide vessel. Our pod never held a human. It flew in the crewless mission Mercury Atlas II, MA-2 for short, but you get the picture. It was so cramped, the astronauts famously joked, you don't get in it, you put it on. We took the hatch off so you can look in, but when I was showing this to kids, I say, now, Put the hatch mentally back, close the hatch. Now you got two little portholes and that's all you got to look out of on either side. Still, peering down the hatch and through capsule number six's dinner plate sized porthole feels a bit like stepping back through time. Before President John F. Kennedy's moon speech, before Mission Control started operations out of Johnson Space Center right here in Houston, before photos of the Hubble telescope mesmerized millions, there was this incredible hunk of junk. And at the center of that story is one very special Houstonian. The guns of World War II had barely cooled when the U.S. entered another global conflict, the Cold War. The struggle for supremacy between America and the Soviet Union, which began around 1947, spanned political, economic, and ideological fronts and would last decades. Yet American spirits stayed high during the early days of this arms race. After all, we'd freed Europe from Hitler, our economy was booming, and to top it all, we had a nuclear bomb. Two, in fact. 
Then seemingly out of nowhere, the USSR launched Sputnik, the world's first man-made satellite, into space on October 4, 1957. Stunned Americans huddled by their radios, listening as the beach ball-sized device signaled back from the stars. Each chilling beep, as Time Magazine called them, projected a clear message to the world. The Soviets were winning the battle for technological and scientific superiority. You could take a telescope and there's a Russian right over your head. And I think the mental construct of that, the fact that there's somebody up there looking down at us, we didn't want that, didn't like that. Once the shock wore off, fear settled in sweeping across the country like a fog. It permeated government meetings, schools, newspapers, even comic book pages. And it wasn't just an existential concern. The U.S.'s rocketry program, in development since the mid-30s, had been born out of military missile technology. If the Russians could launch an object into space, they could most definitely hit the U.S. with a nuclear bomb. Meanwhile, America's rockets still had an embarrassing habit of exploding on the launch pad. Sputnik became a watershed moment, launching the space race and galvanizing U.S. interest in science like never before. Quote, Control of space, proclaimed then Texas Senator and future U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson, means control of the world. End quote. As you can imagine, the U.S. had no plans to give up anything. And so in July 1958, the government founded NASA with the goal of putting an American into space. By November of that same year, these efforts had a name, Project Mercury. It's naive to say that everyone wanted to leave the planet and this was the first step. It was, you know, much more pragmatic. It's always more pragmatic than that. Mercury was a logical evolution of our military skills that we already had. Uh, to going into space. And it had to happen in a sense because we were in a Cold War with Russia. They'd done it, we had to do it. I think it also brought to end the complacency we developed because we'd saved the world. Catching up to the Soviet Union was complicated, to say the least. We knew virtually nothing about how spaceflight would affect the human body. Scientists overcame that hurdle with the help of some primate pioneers. Before John Glenn, there was Air Force-trained astrochimp Ham and other military monkeys. One of them, a sassy squirrel monkey from the Navy named Miss Baker, found soaring through the cosmos so underwhelming that she actually fell asleep during flight. Now, if you ask me, that's bananas. Hey, don't judge her too much. Miss Baker was a trailblazer. She was the first American animal to make it to space and back without complications. She slept so we could soar. Upon her return to Earth, Miss Baker achieved celebrity status. She made the cover of Life magazine, appeared on TV shows like Good Morning America, and received a certificate of merit from PETA. To this day, visitors leave bananas on her gravestone in Huntsville, Alabama. And don't worry, Ham was equally famous. Thanks to Miss Baker, Ham, and those other adventuring ape ronauts, scientists quickly realized there were risks outside of getting a rocket off the ground. They needed to get their astronaut back down without frying them to a crisp, which was a real possibility. Spacecrafts careen back into the Earth's atmosphere at about 17,500 miles per hour, around seven times faster than a bullet whizzing out of a rifle barrel. Slowing down at that speed creates a massive amount of friction as air molecules rub against the spacecraft. And friction creates heat, like upwards of 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit worth of heat. So for comparison, a chocolate bar melts at just 90 degrees Fahrenheit and molten lava spews out of volcanoes at anywhere from around 700 to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. There's only one thing to do in this situation. You have to dissipate the heat. It sounds so obvious to us today, but in the late 50s, it didn't feel so simple. At the time, the science community was hyped on the look of the military's ballistic missiles, long and thin, 
with knife edge wings and a pointed tip at the very top. But the models couldn't take the heat, literally. During speed tests inside wind tunnels, the needle noses melted. NASA's crafts were going to reach even faster speeds than those plaguing these melting missiles. While much loved, the missile design clearly wouldn't work for a spacecraft. It was back to the drawing board. We promised you a Houstonian in this story. Well, enter Dr. Maxime Faget, Max for short. Born abroad in 1921 to an old Louisiana family, Faget came from a line of innovators. In the 1850s, a medical breakthrough made by his great-grandfather helped save New Orleans from an epidemic of yellow fever. Around 90 years later, his father discovered the first successful treatment for leprosy. But Max wasn't interested in medicine, no. After youthful days spent constructing model airplanes and flipping through science fiction magazines, he fell in love with engineering. And in 1958, he came face to face with the ultimate engineering problem, designing the Project Mercury spacecraft. Luckily, Faget was already familiar with the issues surrounding human spaceflight. He'd been working in aeronautics since leaving the Navy in 1946. Even before the creation of NASA itself, Faget had been testing potential vehicle designs by tossing paper plate creations off the Langley Research Center's indoor balconies. True story. Faget was known for his eccentricities, including the habit of standing on his head during meetings to maximize blood flow to the brain. And it sounds like this paper plate party was a regular occurrence too, since according to one eyewitness, his colleagues on the floor below barely gave the falling dishware a second glance. Of course, he wasn't just quirky. Bow tie collection aside, Faget was brilliant and apparently ruthless on the squash court. He brought both of those traits to knock down drag out scientific debates. Opinionated, outspoken, and more often than not, correct in his calculations, he was the kind of person who'd tell you to your face that an idea was dumb recalled another colleague. If you were very far off, he, he could look at a concept and t tell you an awful lot about uh, what, what it could do and couldn't do. This is retired NASA engineer Chet Vaughn, who worked for Max at Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center for almost 20 years. So he knew him pretty well. He was a person that would come up with things that you would just wouldn't think of that you needed to do in your project. But he would do that Almost on every aspect that you went in, when you, when you went in with your next design on it, you'd be close to where you were, and he'd still challenge you to be sure you do it as good as you can be. And that's what he wanted us to be all the time. Really, it's no surprise Faget solved the re-entry problem. Using an almost brand new theory in aerodynamics, Faget and his colleagues threw all conventional wisdom out the window and proposed the exact opposite of a missile. No narrow bodies, no wings, and definitely no pointed noses. Faget's design was a bulky, truncated pyramid with a wide, slightly curved bottom. Some weren't impressed. There's gotta be a way to make wings work, they cried. Wings were super in vogue at the time, thanks to popular general interest magazine, Collier's. But Faget wouldn't stand for it. When he was opposed during a design conference in 1957, the engineer proclaimed to the assembled group that they were researching the wrong idea and he wouldn't bother wasting time pursuing it. Quote, for me, one man at the meeting recalled, Project Mercury was born with Faget's remarks. And in a way, he was right. NASA chose the Faget concept, as it was called, and the science that backed it. A bigger vehicle body meant more drag, which would help slow the capsule down during re-entry. The capsule's blunt bottom, which became the front of the capsule on its return flight, would produce a shock wave as it entered the atmosphere. And that shock wave would deflect air molecules away from the pod. Any superheated, friction-produced plasma that managed to sneak by could be wicked away with the heat shielding on the vehicle's base. Kind of like peeling an onion, layers of fiberglass and synthetic resin would heat up, char, and flake away. Best of all, Faget's plan, while 
arguably clunky in appearance, was way lighter than those winged designs. And as you can imagine, lighter is always better when chucking objects into space. Over the next 14 months, Faget and his team refined their concept. They created external safety measures like the capsule's escape tower, which separated the capsule from its launch rocket in instances of emergency, as well as internal fixtures, including the spacecraft's survival couches. Made to help astronauts withstand the G-forces of launch and landing, these custom-fitted fiberglass seats were individually molded to each crew member's body using a plaster cast, something that's still done today for astronauts traveling to and from the International Space Station. As chief designer, Faget oversaw every step of the project, even the parts he didn't have a direct hand in designing, which, from what we can tell, weren't many. Finally, starting in 1960, NASA put its capsule to the test. Well, really we should say tests. The agency ran 20 uncrewed missions, pushing the limits of Faget's vision in every way possible. Some were disasters. Others, like MA-2, our capsule's mission, were successes. In fact, MA-2 was an especially important trial. At the time, Project Mercury's engineers were considering two different rockets to launch Faget's capsule, the Redstone and the Atlas. Hence the A in names like MA-2. But both rockets were experiencing, well, uh, performance issues on the launch pad. During the first test of the Redstone rocket, infamously called the four inch flight, the launch vehicle rose for mere moments before experiencing engine failure and dropping back onto the launch pad. And it got worse. The shock of the abrupt landing caused Faget's escape system to initiate, except it left the capsule, and with it any hypothetical astronauts, behind. Things weren't looking better for the Atlas rocket. During its initial run, it blew up just 58 seconds after launch, and the capsule didn't survive the crash back to Earth intact. Worst of all, no one could figure out why it exploded. The President, Congress, even the upper echelons of the Pentagon were getting antsy. Another failure, and government leaders back in DC might very well abandon the project. The dream of American manned space travel was suddenly riding on capsule number six, and its mission wasn't a gimme for NASA. The test was purposefully designed to put capsule number six through the worst possible re-entry conditions. Even as engineers made last minute tweaks and the launch team studied the forecast for sunny skies, NASA's deputy administrator and the major general of the Air Force's ballistic missile division tucked conciliatory press statements into their jacket pockets, just in case. Faget wouldn't be on site either, but not out of fear. The mechanical engineer didn't attend any of the Mercury launches or the Gemini launches, or the Apollo launches. He wasn't really interested in the operational sort of phase of a big program. He was much more interested in the design, the creation, test, and evaluation. He's already turned to, you know, the next big thing. Meet our final guest, Nanette Faget, Max's youngest daughter, who followed in her father's footsteps, working 37 years at JSC. I think at some point it probably got to him that like, well, if I do go now, I might jinx it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think he didn't see a shuttle launch until after he retired. As capsule number six took to the air at 9.12 a.m. on February 21st, 1961, scientists and military men alike held their breath. One minute passed, then two. Finally, an audible sigh of relief rippled through mission control. Nothing had blown up. And just under 18 minutes later, the pod plopped down in the Atlantic Ocean, safe and sound. Best of all, after fishing it out of the water, scientists discovered the capsule's temperature was actually lower than they'd expected after such a brutal re-entry. Faget's designs worked, and then some. 364 days later, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth on February 20th, 
1962. He wasn't the first person to do it. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin beat him by 10 months, but that was Russia's last lead in the space race. Worth noting, Glenn's flight was one of the first calculated with computers. Those calculations were double-checked by so-called human computer Katherine Johnson, whose name you may recognize from the film Hidden Figures. Anyway, Glenn flew for just under five hours and circled the globe three times, using the same capsule rocket pairing as the MA2 flight test. In fact, the Mercury capsule reappears time and time again throughout the history of space exploration. We used similar, albeit larger, versions in both the Gemini and Apollo missions. Russia even adopted an analogous design several years after Mercury. What's more, when NASA sends astronauts back to the moon later this decade, and eventually to Mars as part of its new Artemis program, they'll traverse the stars in a space capsule that will still look remarkably similar to Faget's creation. The reason for this is pretty simple. While times have changed, physics hasn't. Here's Carolyn again. The physics haven't changed, the planet's gravity hadn't changed, and the human being hadn't changed. And you're packaging a human being, it's like the old, old story of the egg drop. You know, everybody packages an egg so it won't crash. But the same thing about a human. You're packaging the human in the safest possible way. We all know how the Mercury story ends, or at least the finer points anyway. Five years after its start, the program wrapped. By then, NASA had sent six astronauts into space. Six months after John Glenn's pivotal flight, on a football field right down the road from us here at HMNS, JFK declared to a cheering crowd that we, America, choose to go to the moon and beyond. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Powered by the hopes and dreams of a nation and a whole lot of rocket fuel, we planted our star-spangled signature on the moon before the end of the 1960s, surpassing the Soviet Union and winning the space race once and for all. By 1975, America and Russia were working together on space missions. These days, most of the surviving Mercury capsules are on display at museums throughout the country, including the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, of course, and our good neighbor, Space Center Houston. As for our friend Max Faget, he moved to, you guessed it, Houston in 1962 while still working on Project Mercury. He served 19 years as Director of Engineering and Development at NASA's JSC, contributing to both the Gemini and Apollo missions. He also helped give NASA its long-awaited wings in the form of the space shuttle. My dad had built this model of the space shuttle um, in his garage in the workshop, and it was pretty neat. He he built that out of balsa wood and put the little paper wings. So he, he would tinker around, build this space shuttle model, and then um, fly it in the backyard, kind of launch it and have my brother catch it. That model's now on display at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Even after retiring from NASA, Faget kept pushing the boundaries in space, becoming one of the first to enter the private space sector. Of course, he still got calls from NASA. Chet, you remember Chet. He says he made some of those calls. Sometimes when the pair traveled together for briefings, they'd stop for coffee and donuts. At the time of Fijet's death in 2004, he held 12 patents, including those for the Mercury capsule design, the survival couches, and the emergency escape tower. No American ever used the tower, but two Russian cosmonauts did in 1983 when their launch pad caught on fire just before takeoff. A decade after that incident, those cosmonauts visited Houston and presented Faget with an unofficial Soviet medal. It's won in dozens of awards and accolades he received over the years. His home in Dickinson Bayou even became a historical landmark in 2020. And while Faget remains a relatively unknown figure in the history of American space travel, we wouldn't have the space program of yesteryear or tomorrow without him. I think one of my dad's favorite quote was that as a boy, he liked toys with mechanical parts, things he could make or tweak, and that as he got older, his toys just got bigger. You've been listening to Beyond Bones, 
a podcast from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This episode was written and directed by Emma Schloven and edited and co-narrated by Johnny Hemberger. Special thanks to guests Nanette Faget, Chet Vaughn, and our very own Dr. Carolyn Summoners. Got an object from our collection or a science question you've been dying to learn about? Let us know at podcasts at hmns.org. We might even feature your idea in an upcoming episode. Plus, don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to our little pod on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you stream your podcasts. Leaving a review helps us reach even more curious minds. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening and stay, stay curious. curious.